I think this embodies my father because he was a very giving and generous man. I think there was no one in the world who was more giving and more generous. We say generous to a fault because sometimes people would actually take advantage of him. But, and, you, and you'll hear Bob Evans is going to read some letters from his co-workers and maybe some of you here wrote those letters that you know, he would, he would not even wait for you to ask if he knew you needed something. He would just simply do it. If you needed something fixed on your car, he would just fix it. You wouldn't even have to ask. If he knew you had a need, he would provide for your need, and you wouldn't even have to ask. I don't know how many of our kids and grandkids he gave their first car to, because that's just what he would do. And because he was so giving, he was a very blessed man. Because, you know, what do they say? What goes around comes around, or you reap what you sow. He was a very, very blessed man because of his generosity and his willing to give. Always willing to help. Would drive anywhere to help someone. Would load up his, you know, your car was broken down. He was going to go and he was either going to fix it or he was going to load it on the back of his flatbed trailer and he was going to bring it to his place and he was going to fix it. That's right. I see you. I see you there. <laughs> How many people has he done that for? A lot of people. <laughs> oh, oh, it only no. I mean, I, I, I remember being, you know, 250 miles away and calling and saying, I got a problem. And he was there as quick as he could get there to take care of the problem. And he would do that for everyone. People he had just met, that's what he would do. And, of course, as, as we've already kind of touched on, he could, he could fix anything. I mean, he was really amazing with his hands. He bragged to me one time that he over, overhauled an engine with a pair of pliers and a screwdriver. And I actually believe him. He taught me to work with my hands, and I'm grateful for that. I spent many, many hours with him out in his shop, a lot of times just watching and handing him tools. And even when I was 30 and 40 years old, I still got treated like I was 12. But that's okay. But I also learned a lot. I learned about hard work. He worked all day in the insurance industry, and then he would come home at night and work, and work on the weekends, driving tractors and hauling hay and fixing fence. And I learned to do all of that, whether I wanted to or not. I learned to uh, I learned to drive a standard by driving our old fifty what fifty six fifty seven Massey Harris Ferguson tractor. Had th one two three in reverse, high and low, and had the had the gas on the column up here. That's how we that's how we got it done around there. Taught me to to fix so many things and repair so many things uh, that I still use today that I'm so grateful for. You know, I tell people I'm grateful I grew up, you know, out in the country on a farm and that my dad made me do so many of these things with my hands because I've learned, even as a lawyer, I mean, I still try to do, you know, as much as I can. This is one of, and I'm going to switch gears here for a minute, this is one of those days, I guess, today. It's a tough day and I'm, you know, it's, it's hard for a lot of us. I, I really don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, there's so many days that there's a before and after in life. You hope that most of the time that the days are good, you know, before and after a wedding, before and after a baby, before and after a move, before and after your first house, before and after your degree or your, your first job. Some of them aren't so good. There's always going to be a before it. There's always going to be a before it, a before and an after for the, for this.
and by the way, I don't like to say someone's in a better place. I don't like that. I don't like that, don't like that phrase. However, um, you know, Dad fell and broke his hip about three months ago and uh, was doing, doing, doing pretty good before that. I mean, was getting around and, and still, in fact, he broke his hip. He'd been mowing the lawn. He caught his foot as he was getting off the lawnmower and fell over and just had no, nothing to grab onto, nothing to hang on to. And uh, after that, I mean, he really went downhill a lot. I was here twice in August, the first weekend and the last weekend. And uh, I saw quite a bit of change from the first and the last time. He was, um, had gone downhill quite a bit. And uh, I didn't really say anything to a lot of people about it because I wanted to have hope that he would get better, that it was just a minor setback. But he was having a lot of trouble, was sleeping almost all the time, was himself maybe an hour or two a day, um, wasn't happy because he was the, he had developed some dementia. And, and I guess I'm saying this because I think in this, in this time, I really do believe he's in a better place. Um, I want to be selfish. Darn it, this is frustrating. I want to be selfish and I want to have him around forever, but you know what? It, it wasn't on his terms and he wasn't happy. And so I really do think that he's in a better place. And I want to, and, and I want to say something about, about his wife, Anna, who he's been married to for 23 years. She was amazing. Taking care of him the last few months was a 24 seven job. And I saw firsthand front row how well she did, that she was incredible. You know, I, I, I would say, I mean, I would think to myself, honey, and don't, don't take anything. You know, she's got her own issues. She's the one who needs to be looked after. But she was amazing. You were amazing. The way she took care of him all the time, you know, she would sleep when she could, but she was up and around when he was up and around and needed whatever he needed. She was there to provide it for him. And, and she is to be commended. And thank you. Thank you so much. And, and I'll always, I'll always respect you and appreciate what you did and love you even more. Frankly, I appreciate that. So my dad taught me a lot of good things. He, uh, he taught me some things that weren't so good either, maybe. He taught me to speed. I asked him one time, I said, Dad, I was about 12, 13. I said, Dad, why do you always speed? And he said, I don't speed. I just don't waste time getting anywhere. He taught me to be stubborn. Hopefully I'm not as stubborn as he was. He was, man, he was stubborn. When it came to technology, he didn't like it one bit. One day he complained to me that the, they weren't selling VHS tapes at the, at the video store anymore. They don't have VH tapes anymore. What, what's, what's the deal? I said, Dad, that's old technology. You know, get you a DVD player. They'll start and start watching those. I don't like it. I don't like it one bit. You know, they just come around and they just try to cram technology down our throat. Just, just cram it down our throat. I'm not going to. I don't, I don't like it. <laughs> so I gave him a DVD player for Christmas that year. And he started using it. Another time, this was not long ago, <coughs> they had Dish Satellite Network and they had the same, the same receivers and the same TVs for, I mean, 10 years. 
And so I bought him a, you know, a new t- HD TV. And he was plugging this old, you know, it's, it's like running an eight-track tape through a thousand, you know, two thousand dollar stereo system. It just doesn't matter how good the stereo is if the eight-track tra- tape sounds terrible. So this great TV and this crummy picture. And so one time, one weekend when I was here in the last, I don't know, probably probably six months or so, I said, we're going to get you better TV service. And it's going to be cheaper because they're going to give you all this, and they're going to give you new equipment, and they're going to give you this. And so I got on the phone, and I started calling, and he's like, I don't want it. <laughs> but, but you don't understand. I can, I can get it for you. It'll be better. It'll be cheaper. It'll, you'll love it. You'll, I don't want it. By God, it's worked this long for me. It's just fine. And we got into this huge fight over me trying to do something nice for him. And I finally said, okay, okay, I'll give up. I'll just forget it. So I talked, so I went home back to Texas and I talked to him a couple of days later. He goes, oh yeah, by the way, the new TV, the TV people are coming tomorrow to install the new system. <laughs> Man. My dad gave me a temper. Yeah. I didn't I didn't never heard the expression glen out until recently. But that's what they called it at his office to glen out when he would get mad and throw things and scream to the to the heavens and sky to the top, at the top of his lungs. <laughs> I you know, you can't talk about my dad without talking about his temper. If anybody's seen it, man. <laughs> Who's seen it? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, those of you who didn't, you missed, it was, you missed something, I'm telling you. And he could swear. Man, that man could swear. I tell people, I said, you would pay to hear him swear. He had it down to an art form. It was just amazing how well he could do it. And so guess what? I've got it too. But you're a minister. Well, it doesn't matter. I've still got it. But he had integrity. There was, there, was a, there was not a more honest man on the face of this earth. And I'm, and I'm just not saying that. I mean, we all have our temptations. One time I said something about he needed a TV for a few days. And I said, well, go to Walmart and get one. If you decide in a few days you don't like it, take it back and it'll be okay. He's like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm gonna, if I'm going to buy it, I'm going to keep it. I'm not going to do that. I mean, he, he just would not cut corners when it came to honesty and integrity Years ago, I drove a 67 Ford Galaxy that he gave me, and um, I was driving in, in it, but I, mi- I was missing a couple of hubcaps, and so there was a hubcap place on 23rd, down the street a little ways, I can't remember, maybe around Sooner Road, Hubcap City. And uh, I pulled in there, and I was looking at hubcaps for my, for my car, and you had to buy a set of four, and I, I said, uh, well, you know, how much for these four hubcaps here? And the guy goes, oh, those are... $25 for a set of four. And we talked for a few more minutes, and he said, what's your name, by the way? And I said, Tim Robin. He goes, any relation to Glenn Robin? I said, yeah, I'm his son. And the man said, well, for Glenn, those would be $15. That he, you know, he had such integrity, and he was so loving and giving that people wanted to do things for him, that he was, he was owed so many favors. It would probably take years and years for him to use all the favors up. Um... I'm getting close to being done, don't worry. I'm going to read you a letter. My, my son-in-law could not be here. And I'm going to read you a letter that he sent me. I should have had it prepared. I'm sorry I didn't. I'm going to read you just a little bit of the letter, not all of it. It's actually pretty long, telling my son-in-law, who's been in our family now nine-plus years, and he got a chance to, you know, to spend some quality time with my dad, and, and he talked in the letter about how everything had to be just right. That it wasn't, he, there was no, you know, slapping something together and, okay, it's good enough. It had to be just right. And he says, some people are perfectionists for, just for the sake of being a perfectionist. I believe he was a perfectionist because he had a strong desire for things to be right. And for you to be happy. 
That's what he said about my dad. And I'll tell you one other, one other story about my dad that you may or may not know, but in his later years, he, he became a spiritual person. Um, he was raised in a household where um, he didn't like the religion that he was taught and became a, if not an atheist, certainly an agnostic. I, I, I got into, I became really turned on to God when I was about 19 years old. And of course, I went around and talked to all my friends and families about it immediately. And when I tried to talk to my dad about it, he shut me down pretty quick and said in no uncertain terms, I do not want to talk about it and you will not talk to me about it ever again. Um, and got pretty gruff and rough with me doing that. And I thought, okay, that takes care of that. Well, later in life, I think Anna drug him to church by his ear. She claims he went on his own, and, you know, he may have, he may have done it to please her, but something began to happen, and uh, he began to change. When I was about five or six years ago, maybe, or a little longer, you know, I'm the guy that always prays at Thanksgiving and stuff like that. Oh, Tim, you know, nobody wants to pray. Well, Tim will do it. He, he doesn't mind. So I would always pray. And so one time, so I was always blessing the food before meals. And one time I said, you know what? I do it all the time. Let's let somebody else do it. And my dad prayed. And it, and it wasn't a, you know, Lord, thank you for this food. And, you know, the pants who prepared it and nourishment of our body, you know, amen. I mean, it wasn't that rote memorized, let's get done with it prayer. It was a real prayer with heart. And I was just, I couldn't believe it. I was just like, oh my God, my dad prayed. My dad prayed. I cannot believe it. I heard my dad pray. What an amazing, God, what an amazing thing for me to hear that. Um, wow. And I tell people, I say, you know, there's hope for my dad. There's hope for everybody. So don't give up on those people who aren't yet believers. And I, he went to church, and I went to church with him. And, and it was him. It wasn't Anna saying, come on, let's go to church. It's time to go to church. It was him coming and saying, hey, we are going to church. Are you going to come with us? And so we went to church. And, and, just the la and he would start sending, and he was sending out emails that were, you know, of a religious nature. And I, one time I asked him, I, I said, did Anna... Is Anna getting into your email account, forwarding these emails to me? He's like, oh, no, no, those are mine that I'm sending out. I mean, you know, mixed in with the political stuff and all of that. <laughs> but, you know, that's what he was doing. And even just three weeks ago, we were, I was here three weeks ago and saw him. And we're sitting at the table in the, in the kitchen and watching Joel Osteen. And that's what he wanted to watch. And uh, I liked it. I like Joel Osteen. I think he's a pretty good guy. He has a great message. And, uh, and, I, and he said, oh I've, asked, I've, oh, I've heard this one before. And I said, really? He goes, oh, yeah, I watch, I watch him all the time. So that's something you probably didn't know. A lot of even fam people in the family didn't know that. He was a little private about it and a little secret. But he became a spiritual man, a man of faith. And I have no doubt in my heart that he is, that his next waking moment will be with the Lord Jesus Christ and that we will see him one day at the biggest party ever, ever thrown. So in closing, I would like to say a couple of things. I've seen members of my family that I haven't seen in years, and that's been a, a blessing. But let's not wait till the next funeral to see each other again. And... Sometimes somebody will pass, and, and this happened to me with an uncle about three years ago where I dropped everything and I ran to his funeral, and I thought to myself, why did I do that? I should have dropped everything and ran to him when he was alive. And so think about that as well. Go see some people before it's too late, and let's not let the funeral be the next time you all get together and enjoy each other's company. Thank you. God bless you.